This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. This week, I'll wrap up the series Twin Terrors with one more case of sisters behaving badly. Being or having a twin is a unique relationship that can be a blessing or fraught with challenges. In the first case I covered about the Gibbon sisters, you saw sisters who were so close they became codependent in a way that led to their undoing. But what if a twin relationship starts out as competitive and then turns deadly? In this episode, I'll tell you a story about twin sisters, once so close, who turn against one another. One of them will decide that the only way to finally best her sister is by murder. This is the last chapter in the series, Twin Terrors, the case of Sunny and Gina Hahn. Identical twin sisters Sunny and Jean Hahn were born on April 4, 1974, in Incheon, South Korea. Jean, or Gina as she would be called, was born five minutes after her sister Sunny. Those five minutes might not seem like much to most, but in the Han family, they made all the difference. Sunny would be considered the firstborn of the family and as such held a position of authority over her sister. Bu Han Kim, the girl's mother, made it very clear from the beginning that Sunny was considered the superior child and that Gina was to defer to her older sister in all things. As you can imagine, this set up a situation from the beginning of the twins' lives where they would always be in competition with one another. Not only did Bu Han give higher billing to Sunny due to her elder child position, but she just seemed to prefer Sunny over Gina. This would become very apparent when the girls were still very young and their parents separated. Gina was sent to live with her father, while Sunny remained with her mother. The sisters lived apart for three years, although they saw each other often. Even with the inherent rivalry and competition between them, Sunny and Gina remained close as twins and as sisters. Family members and friends said that the girls even possessed a twin psychic connection. For example, while living apart, if one would become ill and be taken to the doctor, the other would inevitably be discovered waiting in the doctor's office upon arrival, often suffering from the same illness. When their parents' divorce became final, the girls' father granted full custody of both children to Buhan. Their mother then decided to move to the U.S. with the girls, settling first in Seattle, where the girls were cared for by a relative, while Bu Han worked. About a year later, the family moved to Southern California. By this time, the girls were entering their pre-teen years and just beginning junior high school. Up until now, the girls had lived a life that was unstable at best. Their mother had bounced around between homes and jobs, sometimes leaving the girls with relatives or friends and sometimes on their own. Now, living in Orange County, California, Bu Han took a job as a cocktail waitress in a casino. While employed there, she developed a gambling addiction and spent more and more time away from home. Sunny and Gina were often home alone, and they learned to fend for themselves. Without family or other support nearby, the girls relied on each other. They learned to cook, helped each other with homework, and looked out for one another. Bu Han, falling deeper in debt due to her gambling, couldn't afford to keep a roof over their heads. She reached out to a distant relative, James Norris, and his wife, the girl's aunt and uncle. She asked to borrow money to pay the rent. Instead, they offered to take the girls in to live with them at their home in Campo, California, a border town located in San Diego County. Bu Han agreed, and the girls moved 150 miles away from their mother, who remained in Orange County. For the first time, the girls experienced a traditional family life, and they thrived. They loved their new home and quickly became part of the family. They ate dinner as a family every night, took family vacations to Disneyland and camping, and enjoyed a stable home at last. Their uncle James would later remark that the one thing he observed whenever the girls were given anything, whether it be clothes or Christmas presents, Sunny and Gina always made sure they received equal amounts. They began high school and although they were still working on their English language skills, they worked hard, earning straight A's. But it was in school that their old rivalry began to show itself again. 
Gina, always made to feel inferior to her sister, worked twice as hard in order to earn better grades than Sunny. But everything always seemed to come easier for Sunny than for Gina. She did well in school without having to put in as much effort as her sister, and she was the more popular of the two. Sunny was more outgoing and made friends easily. Gina, in contrast, was shy and a more serious student. She wasn't as popular as her sister. Gina would become angry at Sunny when she felt she was being left behind socially. She was jealous when Sunny was the first to have a boyfriend, first to be asked to prom, and other milestones of teen life. She would lash out at her sister, and the girls would have loud arguments, which sometimes even led to physical altercations. Gina would always feel she was playing catch-up with her sister, and her resentment grew. Still, they both excelled academically, and when they graduated from Mountain Empire High School, they walked with honors and were even co-valedictorians at their graduation ceremony. This was a remarkable achievement, since the girls had come to the U.S. and learned English only six years earlier. It was obvious that they were both very bright girls who could accomplish anything they set their minds to. After graduation, the girls were still together, working in a restaurant, but they had different ideas and goals for the future. It seems that both of them desired to break away from one another and be their own person. Sunny made it her goal to attend college, while Gina considered a career in the military. Sunny, still not sure what career she wanted to pursue, nevertheless received a scholarship to attend the University of Laverne, three hours away from home and just east of Los Angeles. She packed up and moved to the campus, leaving her sister behind once again. Gina continued to work at the restaurant, planning to save up enough money to also enroll in college. But she later decided to enlist in the Air Force after studying for and receiving her United States citizenship. She left for basic training, but her uncle would later say he didn't think Gina was ready for adult life, especially on her own without her sister. As per his prediction, Gina struggled once she entered boot camp. The training was rigorous, and Gina couldn't keep up. Looking for a way to be released from service, she put in a request, saying that her father was ill. When it was discovered that this was false, she was denied. Her family asked why she wanted to leave the service, and rather than telling them the truth, said that she had a secret that made her ineligible for service, although she didn't elaborate. Later, it was discovered that Gina reported to the Air Force that she was a lesbian. At the time she was serving in the military, the United States had a don't-ask-don't-tell policy on military service by gays, bisexuals, and lesbians. The policy prohibited military personnel from discriminating against or harassing closeted homosexual or bisexual service members or applicants while barring openly gay, lesbian, or bisexual persons from military service. Because Gina came out as lesbian to her superiors, she was allowed to be released from service. Gina returned home to Campo, California. Meanwhile, Sunny had started off well in college, earning good grades, and seeming to do well on her own. But she was attending college with a lot of young people from Los Angeles, and she soon wanted to emulate some of her more financially well-off classmates' lifestyles. Sunny began wearing designer clothes and attending more parties and get-togethers to fit in with the in-crowd. As a result, her grades suffered. This, combined with the fact that she didn't really have a plan about her major or what line of study she was pursuing in college, made her lose focus. After three semesters in college, Sunny's scholarship was revoked due to her poor grades, and she dropped out. She stayed in the Los Angeles area and took a job as a receptionist. Her sister Gina, back in San Diego County, following in her mother's footsteps, took a job working as a waitress in a casino. Her goal was to become a blackjack dealer, but instead she began gambling when she wasn't working. Like Boo Kim, Gina would gamble away all of her paychecks and was left trying to figure out how to pay her bills. She applied for credit cards, receiving cash advances that she would then use to try to win back her losses. In this way, her debts grew as she blew thousands of dollars at the card tables. Feeling like more of a failure than ever and increasingly desperate, Gina attempted suicide by swallowing a handful of sleeping pills and washing them down with alcohol. She was admitted to La Mesa Hospital in January 1996. The Norrises were contacted, and they rushed to her side. She was in stable condition, and her uncle questioned her about why she had tried to end her own life. 
Gina explained that she felt like the world was coming down on her. She was on her own, she said, and had no one to help her. She couldn't handle life on her own anymore, she said. The Norrises took her home and tried to help her, but Gina continued to gamble. At this point, Gina resorted to crime to feed her gambling addiction. She first began stealing small amounts from her friends. Next, she began forging checks and stealing credit cards, maxing them out before discarding them. In April of 1996, she was arrested for cashing forged checks she'd stolen from her uncle, his mother, and a family friend. The theft amounted to over $9,000. She was charged with two counts of second-degree burglary, two counts of grand theft, and two counts of check forgery. Less than two weeks later, Gina's Uncle James discovered blank checks and credit cards stolen from his safe. He discovered over $20,000 worth of funds had been stolen from their business account and almost $15,000 from their personal account. They could no longer excuse Gina's behavior. The family who had taken her in, put a roof over her head, provided for her, loved her, and encouraged her in all things, were repaid for their kindness and generosity by being stolen from to the tune of thousands of dollars. Her uncle could see no other option but to turn Gina in to the authorities. When she was arrested, more credit cards stolen from others were found in Gina's wallet. She was now facing the additional charges of one count of receiving stolen property and five counts of forgery. She was sentenced to 10 days in jail and placed on three years probation. Sunny, on the other hand, seemed to be living well, having moved back to Orange County, where she'd once lived with her mother and sister. Orange County, home to tourist destinations like Disneyland and Huntington Beach, also caters to the wealthy with expensive beachfront properties, yacht clubs, and high-end retail stores and malls. Sunny, now living in Irvine, just a stone's throw away from Tony Newport Beach, seemed to be enjoying a high-class lifestyle. She was always dressed in designer clothes, drove a BMW, and went on shopping sprees in expensive boutiques. Her friends wondered how she could afford such luxuries as a college dropout with an entry-level job. Truth was, Sunny had a secret. Like her sister, she was living above her means on credit cards and deeply in debt. And also like her sister, she had begun to steal in order to continue living her lavish lifestyle. Sunny had pinched credit cards from friends and racked up big balances on them, all while presenting herself as a successful single woman. She was finally caught when she won on a $1,300 shopping spree with a friend's credit card. When her friend found out, she called the police. Sunny was arrested and charged with petty theft. She was fined and put on three years probation. Even though she was caught stealing from a friend, Sunny showed no remorse. When asked to account for her actions, she simply replied that her friend was rich and she didn't think that she would mind. When asked to comment on the Han sisters later, a clinical psychologist would say that they never learned adequate coping skills. In addition, in my opinion, the girls, having bounced around in an unstable home as children and neglected by their mother, were operating in survival mode, never planning their lives more than a few days or weeks into the future. Having sometimes survived on next to nothing, no food in the refrigerator, and under frequent threat of being evicted from their home, Money and material possessions became synonymous with safety and security for them. They would do anything, including lie and steal, to obtain these things. Even though they had been taken in and provided for as teens by a loving family, the psychological damage had been done, and the girls never felt that they possessed enough to feel truly safe. As a result, Sunny and Gina's lives quickly spun out of control once they were on their own. Sunny, now on probation in Orange County, rented another apartment in Irvine. After four years apart, she asked her sister to come and live with her once she'd been released from jail. Gina accepted, even though in doing so, she was skipping out on her probation in San Diego County. At first grateful to her sister for taking her in, old patterns soon began to emerge. Gina, at her lowest now, began to observe her sister's lifestyle and became jealous. Sunny had a closet full of designer clothes, nice furnishings in her apartment, and drove a sports car. In contrast, Gina had nothing but the clothes on her back. Of course, Sunny probably didn't admit that most of her expensive possessions were in fact stolen by using others' credit cards. 
Sunny still continued to live like she didn't have a care in the world, somehow getting money or credit enough to continue on with her shopping sprees. Meanwhile, Gina seethed in anger that her sister, once again, was the winner, while she was the proverbial loser. Gina decided to take her revenge by now stealing from her own sister. She would wear Sunny's clothes, take money out of her wallet, and even stole her BMW, driving it around like it was her own. As time went on, Gina became even more disrespectful towards Sunny until her sister had finally had enough. She demanded that Gina respect her as her elder. She was in charge, she reminded Gina. Hearing this come out of her sister's mouth after all the years she was made to feel inferior enraged Gina. The girls began to get into physical fights, like when they were young. Finally, the worst fight between them occurred after Gina took off in Sunny's car and didn't return for several days. When she finally did return to the apartment, Sunny was furious and began attacking her sister. Gina fought back, and they began hitting one another and pulling each other's hair. Then Sunny reached for a phone and threw it at her sister. It hit Gina in the face, breaking her nose. The neighbors had heard the altercation and called the police. They arrived to find the apartment in chaos and Gina bleeding profusely from the nose. Gina told the cops that her sister had assaulted her. Sunny was arrested and taken to jail. Gina finally believed that she'd gotten revenge on her sister for all the years of being relegated to second place. But her victory was short-lived. Sunny only spent 72 hours in jail and was then released. But during the three days that Sunny was behind bars, Gina took advantage of the situation. She had access to her identical twin sister's identification, credit cards, and car. She went on a shopping spree, racking up thousands of dollars in bills without a second thought. When Sunny returned home, she immediately heard from friends how her twin was driving around town in her car, pretending to be her and spending money freely. Sunny immediately knew that Gina must be stealing from her, a fact that was confirmed with a quick call to her bank. Now it was Sunny's turn to get revenge. Not only did she lock her sister out of her apartment, but she called the police to report her theft and informed them that Gina was currently on probation in San Diego County. Gina was arrested and on September 5, 1996, pled guilty to one count of second-degree burglary. She was sentenced to a year in jail and ordered to pay nearly $10,000 in restitution. While incarcerated, Gina's rage against her sister began to grow. She told another inmate that she hated her sister and wanted to see her dead. She even told her of a plan she was forming to escape, cash in gold jewelry, and fly from Tijuana, Mexico to Korea. But she didn't detail the rest of her plan. That was to kill her sister and assume her identity before fleeing with her money and possessions. Gina Han had decided that all of her problems, her financial problems and her legal problems, would be solved if she could assume her sister's identity permanently. And to do this, she realized, all she had to do was eliminate her rival. Gina began to hatch a plan to get rid of her sister and assume her identity. But first, she had to get out of jail. Gina was allowed to serve part of her sentence in a work furlough program. She was allowed to leave the jail for a five-hour pass. At her first opportunity, she escaped while on work furlough. Now free, she began to put her plan into place. First, she had to find someone to help her carry out the murder. She began talking to people to find out who she might hire as a hitman. Most people she approached thought she was just kidding or that she wasn't completely serious, but she finally found someone who would take her seriously. 18-year-old Archie Bryant was the cousin of one of Gina's friends. Archie said that he was game, and somehow another boy, a friend of Archie's, was also enlisted in the plot. 16-year-old John Sayerith signed on as well. Both teens were promised $100 apiece by Gina for helping her carry out her sister's murder. Gina explained the plan to the boys in which they would ambush Sunny in her apartment. She would obtain the murder weapon and help clean up the crime scene. Gina told the teens that they were to subdue her sister, but they were not to kill her. I want to kill that bitch, she allegedly said. On November 6, 1996, Gina, along with Archie and John, drove 85 miles north from San Diego to Irvine. They stopped at a store to purchase garbage bags, duct tape, 
rope, gloves, pine saw cleaner, and magazines. In the early afternoon, they reached Sonny's apartment complex. Gina attempted to get a key to Sonny's apartment from the leasing office, thinking they would assume she was her sister. But this plan was foiled when they asked her to show identification. She then told Archie and John to knock on her sister's door and pretend to be selling magazines to gain entrance. John knocked on the door once, but no one answered. He tried again 30 minutes later, and one of Sunny's roommates, Angie Kim, answered, but said she was not interested and shut the door. She left the apartment soon afterwards. Then a little after 3 p.m., both Archie and John knocked on the door once again, and this time they had a loaded gun. Another of Gina's roommates, 19-year-old Helen Kim, answered this time and was asked if she'd like to buy some magazines. She also declined, but when she went to shut the door, the boys pulled the gun out and pointed it at her while barging into the apartment. Once inside, they pushed Helen to the floor while she pleaded for her life, saying, Please don't hurt me. Take anything you want. The boys told her to shut up and tied her hands behind her back before placing duct tape over her mouth. Sunny was home and was in her bathroom when she heard the commotion in the living room. She locked herself in the bathroom and quickly grabbed her cell phone and dialed 911. She whispered into the phone that male intruders were in her home, and she believed her roommate was being raped. She whispered, hurry, 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 before the line went dead. Archie Bryant had forced himself into the bathroom just as Sunny hung up with the 911 operator. He asked who she was talking to, and Sunny said she had just been on the phone with a friend. Archie grabbed her and threw her down on the bedroom floor and began tying her up. She pleaded with him to leave her alone and take anything he wanted, but he just told her to shut up or he would shoot her. She was terrified. Archie instructed John to help him tie Sunny up, who was struggling with him. In the meantime, Helen had gotten loose from her bindings and tried to make a run for the door. She was intercepted by John, who told her he should, quote, shoot her for that, unquote. The men then led both Helen and Sunny into the bathroom, placing them both inside the bathtub with their hands and feet bound and duct tape over their mouths and wound around their heads. The girls heard Archie tell John they were, quote, ready to polish her off, go get Gina, unquote. John left the apartment. Sunny's eyes went wide and her heart dropped into her stomach. Had she heard right? Could her sister be involved? But the police were already on their way to the apartment, alerted by Sunny's 911 call. While the girls waited in the bathroom, they could hear one or both of the men rummaging around in the bedroom. Sunny heard her car keys jingling and knew they were rummaging through her purse. Just then, she heard one of the men say, Shit, the police! Archie then entered the bathroom frantic. He began removing the girls' bindings and trying to remove the duct tape from their mouths and extricate it from their hair that it had been caught in. He told the girls to tell the cops that it had all been a big joke. Sonny and Helen then walked out of the apartment, followed by Archie. Two officers had arrived, Greg McFarland and Rich Bartolo. McFarland had approached a car with two occupants inside in the parking lot, while Bartolo walked towards the apartment. Gina Hahn was in the driver's seat of the car, while John Sayareth sat in the passenger side. As the officer approached, Gina asked, Is there a problem, officer? He asked who she was, and she said she was a resident of the building, and she'd just gotten into an argument with her roommate and was sitting outside. She identified herself as Sunny. Officer Bartolo saw a man exit the apartment and then run back inside. Another officer, Eric Wiseman, had arrived as a backup and now approached the apartment with Bartolo. The girls exited the apartment in a disheveled state, with duct tape still clinging to their hair, their faces stricken. They began crying harder upon seeing the officers that had come to their rescue. The officers pointed their weapons at Archie, demanding he get on the ground. He ran back into the apartment, but came out minutes later and was put into handcuffs. While this was taking place, Gina left her vehicle and ran up to an officer screaming, What's wrong with my sister? Is she okay? The officer, unsure of who she was, and preoccupied with arresting the intruder, told her to return to her car, and someone would speak with her shortly. She returned to the vehicle, driving away with John still a passenger. They began driving back south towards San Diego. They made one stop in Laguna Beach to withdraw $5,000 using Sunny's credit cards. They knew they had to ditch the rental car that they'd been seen in at Sunny's apartment building. At 7 p.m., they arrived in San Juan Capistrano and tried to purchase a car at a dealership, again using Sunny's identification. 
but the plan was thwarted when the salesperson said they'd have to wait 24 hours for the credit check to come back. Gina was desperate to cross the border into Mexico, just a few miles south of San Diego, but she still wanted to swap the cars out first. Her next plan was to rent a different car at the San Diego airport. However, at the same time that police officers were responding to Sunny's 911 call, the Irvine Police Department received a call from the El Cajon Police Department in San Diego County. They were reporting information received by an informant regarding a solicitation of murder. The informant had reportedly overheard Gina Hahn talk about looking for someone to kill her sister. Gina's name and description, along with the information that she might be using her sister's identification and credit cards, was put out as an all-points bulletin. When Gina arrived at the Alamo Rent-A-Car office at the airport and presented Sunny's identification, police were called. The rental agency employees stalled for time to keep her and John at the office. At 10.30 p.m., police arrived and surrounded the building, drawing their weapons on Gina Hahn and John Sayreth. At first, Gina still tried to pass herself off as her twin sister, but finally surrendered. The car was searched, and police found Sunny's credit cards, passport, driver's license, and $4,000 cash. They also found cleaning supplies, rope, and trash bags in the trunk. A bullet and bullet casings matching the weapon found on Archie Bryant were recovered from the car as well. In Gina's possession, receipts were found for two pairs of gloves, poly twine, and duct tape. They were both taken into custody. When investigators first informed Sunny about her sister's plot to murder her, she said it wasn't possible. She still believed that her sister was in custody in San Diego County, not knowing that she had escaped her work furlough assignment and gone on the run. But police had already questioned Archie Bryant, who'd told them that the murder plot was all Gina's idea. He explained that Gina wanted to kill her sister to assume her identity. She had also been the one to plan the murder, as well as obtain the weapon and other items for the disposal of her sister's body and the cleanup afterwards. He said that Gina wanted to be the one to shoot her sister, something he believed would have happened had the police not arrived in time. Sonny was at first devastated and gave the police an interview about her sister's earlier actions, including stealing from her and assuming her identity. She told them that her sister had a serious gambling addiction. But unable to live with the knowledge that her twin would truly want her dead, she began to change her mind about cooperating with the police. Gina called Sunny from jail and convinced her that the police were lying and that she, of course, never planned to kill her. Sunny wanted to believe her, so she decided that the police had manipulated her into believing the worst, and it couldn't possibly be true. But Sunny didn't have a choice whether she wanted to cooperate or not. She was still called to testify at her sister's trial. On October 30, 1997, Sunny took the stand and proceeded to tell the court about the hardship she and Gina had suffered growing up, about her mother's neglect, their poverty, and being immigrants in a foreign country with no support system. She said she loved her sister and that they were best friends. Sunny said she didn't believe Gina would ever have plotted to kill her. Sunny came across as a very strong witness on her first day in court. She was well-dressed in a tailored outfit, looking professional, well-groomed, and well-spoken. She was calm and articulate on the stand, and the defense saw her appearance as a win for their side. But on the second day, Sunny seemed like a completely different person. She appeared disheveled, was wearing no makeup, and was slurring her words. When questioned, she admitted that she'd taken sleeping pills the night before. Before court was adjourned, Sunny became more pale and finally collapsed. An ambulance was called, and she was rushed to the emergency room it was determined that she was suffering from an overdose of sleeping pills. Sunny was revived, but she was in no condition to return to court right away. The trial was held up for another week while she recovered. It would appear that Sunny had remained in denial after her ordeal and her sister's arrest, not willing to believe that Gina would actually plan to kill her. But when she was faced with the reality of the trial and upon hearing more details of the crime while on the stand, perhaps she could no longer fool herself. When she allowed herself to consider that it was probably true and Gina did plan to murder her, she tried to blot out this terrible fact by ingesting sleeping pills and accidentally overdosed. Sunny wasn't the only one who didn't want to believe Gina capable of such a heinous act. 
Her uncle, James Norris, also excused her behavior, saying no one got hurt and said he would never believe Gina would try and hurt her sister. On November 29th, after 10 hours of deliberation over three days, the jury found Gina Hahn guilty of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. Her co-conspirators, Archie Bryant and John Sayareth, were also found guilty. At her sister's sentencing hearing, Sunny begged the judge for leniency, saying she still didn't believe Gina truly ever wanted to harm her. But the judge wasn't swayed and handed down the maximum sentence of 26 years to life. The case of the Han twin murder plot blew up in the media. Sunny Han was hounded for interviews. She began appearing in the media and even briefly became a minor celebrity. She hired a manager and was even in talks for a film to be made about the case, reported to be for a $2 million payout. But the project was scrapped, and soon after, Sunny Han dropped out of the media and then completely out of sight. Gina was sent to the Chowchilla Correctional Institution for Women to serve her sentence. She appeared at several parole hearings over the years, where she finally admitted that she had wanted to kill her sister. She also admitted that she'd been the one to plan it and directed the two young men in the commission of that plan. Gina's final parole hearing was scheduled for October 31, 2017, almost exactly 21 years after she was arrested for the failed murder plot. In July of that year, she underwent a psychological assessment in preparation for the parole hearing. It was conducted by Dr. Brianna Satterwaith, forensic psychologist for the Board of Parole Hearings. In her assessment, she diagnosed Gina Hahn with borderline personality disorder with antisocial traits. She explained that such a diagnosis would not generally be expected to significantly remit without care. She also pointed out that Gina Hahn had never participated in mental health treatment as part of her rehabilitation. Furthermore, she noted that Gina seemed to have little insight into her actions or her crime for which she was incarcerated. She had recited the facts of her crime for the parole board with little emotion and in a very matter-of-fact way. She blamed her childhood for her problems and characterized her mother as mean, abusive, and toxic. She reserved her emotions for herself when she outlined for the parole board her mistreatment by her mother and sister, saying she was always made to feel inferior. The doctor did, however, point out that Gina Hahn had a relatively positive disciplinary record in prison and that she had taken advantage of educational opportunities while incarcerated. She finally suggested that she consider Gina a low risk for violence if released. The board voted to grant parole to Gina Hahn. The Orange County Office of the District Attorney opposed her release, writing a letter to Governor Jerry Brown on November 20, 2017. They pointed to her lack of insight and remorse for her crime, as well as the untreated diagnosis of borderline personality disorder with antisocial traits. They warned that, quote, without specific crucial steps to address her personality disorder, she poses a serious safety risk, unquote. Nikki Chambers, the deputy district attorney, wrote, At the parole hearing, Gina Hahn at first blush appeared to have attempted introspection. However, she is very intelligent and still manipulative. She wrote to the governor that as part of her parole plans, Gina Hahn submitted letters from men all over the country and even abroad that she had corresponded with while in prison. She had convinced these men to offer her money, housing, jobs, and one man in England had even given her $100,000 after corresponding with her for a year. The fact remains, Chambers wrote, that she is still flexing the manipulation muscles that she used when she recruited two young men to murder her sister and they appear to be just as keen as they were in 1996. But the governor allowed Gina Hahn's parole to be granted, and she was released from prison on May 24, 2018, at the age of 44. Gina's whereabouts are unknown, as are her sister Sunny's. Both have disappeared from the public eye. While we may think it improbable that they are together, it is not completely far-fetched. As a matter of fact, at her parole hearing, even after characterizing her relationship with her mother and sister as abusive and toxic, Gina inexplicably included in her parole plans her goal of reuniting with them. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime, and that will wrap up the series Twin Terrors. 
If you'd like to get bonus episodes, access to live videos, Q&A sessions, discounted merchandise, sign-up perks, and more, you can become a member of Once Upon a Crime on Patreon for just $2 a month and unlock even more perks at either the $5 or $10 levels. Go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime for more information and to join. And since it's the end of the month, it's time to announce our latest Patreon members and announce the winner of this month's drawing. The newest members are Leah C., Heather N., Kareen L., Tamara P., Lisa C., Jackie S., Jill B., Zoe B., Michelle G., Thomas K., Nicholas W., Sherry H., Eliana B., Amber B., Jeannie L., Peggy K., Sarah M., Rachel V., Sarah N., Chris C., Sylvia W., Cynthia S., Sharon K., Jackie H., Danielle J., Martha H., Rebecca T., and Danielle D. Thank you all so much for becoming Patreon members. Every month I do a drawing from all Patreon members to send you a prize pack with some true crime goodies as well as OUAC merchandise. And this month's winner is Denise Berg from Lakewood, Colorado. Congratulations, Denise. I'll be getting that prize pack out in the mail to you soon. I'd like to give a special thanks to Lorena Garcia for helping in the research for this episode. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Until next time, be good to one another. Thank you.